Is this thing on? John Patsy has over 25 years of experience in building automation, energy management, and M2M. Having served in senior level, man sorry, served senior level positions for manufacturers of hardware and software products, including VP product development for Andover Controls, President and CEO of Tritium, and Global Director of Sales for Cisco Systems and Smart and Connected Buildings Groups. I'd like to, uh, without any further delay, bring up John Patsy, please, uh, CMM founder of Scott Foundry. Thanks everybody, really appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and uh, participate in this session, so thanks a lot. So, um, you know, we've seen a bunch of new technology today, and I, I think that's another message here, is we can't stand still with our buildings. Uh, economics won't allow it, um, sustainability requirements, removing regulations. So we've seen some interesting technology, I want to add one more to that, and uh, talk about the role of analytics, where we're, what we're doing is we're really bringing in technology that most organizations have in their financial suite to look at their financial performance, but now bringing it into the operation of our facilities. So it starts with this question. Do we really know how our buildings operate? And I'll, I'll suggest we don't. Because uh, as Rick said, we have lived, all of us, I've been involved in running buildings, in the reactive mode. As long as no one's screaming, I get other stuff to do. But the person that isn't screaming it, that's good, but what is screaming is the waste of energy, the waste of operational costs, and it's not just about energy. So, do we know how our buildings really operate? Oops. I have to ask the question, if we think we do, who's watching to make sure, okay? Who verifies that what they're doing is right? There's a difference between a failure and things just not operating efficiently, right? That the control strategies were well designed that the assumptions were correct. You know, one of the challenges we have is buildings are all different. When we go in to apply systems, design the mechanical systems, apply the controls, we all start with our best intentions, our best knowledge, all our years of experience, and a expected understanding of the facility. There's assumptions involved. Are we going back and checking those assumptions? Are things still running as expected? They haven't been interfered with. Nobody's overridden set points because there was a problem with the earlier set point reset strategy and we just got frustrated, so we just overrode them. Nobody overrode schedules, right? The problem is buildings are just too complex for uh, this to be managed long term by human beings. There's too much data and the systems we have are too complex. So the reality is the buildings aren't running the way we expect and we need new tools to help us. And what we want to talk about today is analytics. Our technology is called SkySpark Analytics. And what it does is it automatically takes the data that we now have in these systems coming up over their internet connections and applies algorithms to find issues in the data, to find equipment faults. That's a, that's a good thing, and you can say, well, you know, equipment faults can be found with alarms, and I'll show you the difference between alarms. Uh, in fact, here's, here's a good way to describe it. You know what an alarm is? You're in the emergency room on a gurney. Okay, you know what analytics is? Your blood pressure's a little high, your cholesterol's a little high, you could stand to lose about 20 pounds. Oh, come on. <laughs> <Sorry>. <laughs> <laughs> All right? That's the difference. Where do you want to be? Where do you want to be tonight? Home saying, I really shouldn't have that extra piece of cake, or in the emergency room. Right? So it's not just about faults, and that's how we have to change our mind. Okay? What about performance deviations? Okay? What about opportunities for energy savings? We talk about demand response. One of the things that our analytics can do is assess the profile of a building and say, hey, we got a great candidate here. Look, our peak is within this period of time. It happens here. We can definitely pre-cool and, and smooth out our peaks so that we can participate and get those checks, okay? <laughs> so what our what technology does is we say it helps you find what matters in the data from the systems you already have. Okay. This is interesting. I uh, just recently uh, got this information, research um, from two major organizations on, on the U.S. side determined that it was the HVAC control system, not the actual equipment itself, that was responsible for the most issues and was the leading cause of energy waste. Okay. Lawrence Berkeley National Labs did a study of 60 buildings and the highest frequency of problems was with the control system. 
overridden, not program right, algorithms not right, not running expected, assumptions were wrong. 77% of the savings that Texas A&M did in a research project were just from correcting control programs, not swapping out chillers or air handlers just from addressing that. So we really have to ask ourselves, okay, do we know how our buildings are running? So what type of issues might you find with analytics? And again, we're not talking about the catastrophe when we know there's no cooling. We're talking about simultaneous heating and cooling are running. It's kind of okay in here. Do you or I know whether that unit is heating and cooling simultaneous to make us comfortable? No. We're comfortable? Yeah. Who cares, right? Okay, one of the big problems, you have big open space retail stores, eight or ten rooftops. Nine of them are cooling on a hot day. One of them's programmed a little wrong and it's heating. But you know what? It's big space. Everybody seems fine. We've seen situations where that's gone on for a year. Okay? Short cycling. You know, you can argue there's some energy waste. There's a lot of capital equipment cost waste, right? Because you're going to shorten the life of a 20 year piece of equipment. Okay? And then lack of diversity control. In order to achieve the demand response program and get those checks, one of the things we implemented was called diversity control. I have 10 rooftops, but I'm, my program's only going to allow seven of them to run at one time. I'm going to pick the seven that need it the most. Right? We set that up as a good program. I saw it work once. Is it working today? How do we know? Okay. So these are the types of things that analytics find by looking at the data. And there's all the energy related stuff. Where do we stand in our energy intensity use, KW or BTUs per square foot per degree day, compared to benchmarks, industry or government, compared to baselines, how we've been doing, compared to our corporate sustainability goals, et cetera? and identifying where we deviate by how much and what that cost is and telling us so we have more information to decide where we're going to spend our time and our financial resources to improve our buildings. And then there's stuff that's equipment oriented. We call it fault detection, but it's, I want to point out how different it is from alarms. How about we're no longer achieving adequate delta T temperature drop across a coil? We're keeping the space comfortable, but we're not getting the proper delta T. Now, does it happen for short periods of time, 15 minutes, 30 minutes at a time, randomly through the day, which might be related to some mechanical problem, valve sticks or something? Or does it happen all day, every day, indicating maybe we ought to clean the gunk out of the coils? Big difference, but the building's still running. And this is what we got to get away from, is if we only manage by total exception reactive, we're leaving lots of money on the table. Economizers open during times they shouldn't be, etc. So these are types of things that analytics can find in the data from your systems. And it'll find and provide the cost. It'll detect the problem. And I'm, we're going to go live and show you this live. It'll detect the problem. It'll show you the cost so you can see the time, the duration, the cost impact of operational issues. Because you know what? As much as we want to, we can't fix all the stuff in our buildings. It's an impossibility to have everything perfect. That's not the goal. But if I can see that, holy smokes, across two of my sites, I wasted $350 because I've overridden my system, that might justify a service call to get that fixed because I might have a 30-day payback on it. Right? Again, with our energy performance, we'll show you how we can show you why your energy curve looks the way it does. It'll tell you what's impacting. We'll show you how you can automatically compare against benchmarks and baselines, et cetera. And then another thing called key performance indicators, right? Tracking the health, right? Like your blood pressure, like your cholesterol. Tracking whatever are key performance indicators for your facility, whether it's KWH per square foot per degree day, uh, whether it's the cost of issues across your portfolio. So you can see those types of health checks and understand better. The whole goal is to start managing our facility by information and fact as opposed to, you know, gut instinct, right? Which has a role, but facts really help us make better decisions. And one of the things we, we like to point out is it's easier to get started than you might think. Um, this is an adjunct, an add additive, uh, an accessory to the automation systems you have. You can take the data that you have from your different systems, bring it in, and apply the analytics engine to automatically find these patterns in your buildings. And one of the neat things about it is you can start small, you can't put in half a control system. Okay. But you can put in a little bit of analytics and detect issues, get return on investment. We have some, some partners when they deploy 90 day return on investment from that first sweep of analytics. Then justify going deeper and deeper. 
and get results. Uh, these are just, you know, num numbers matter. These are some examples of uh, one of them used it specifically to identify demand reduction strategies and across 56 sites generated $350,000. Another one, manual override. I mean, you know, I know everybody in this room runs their buildings better than that, but for some reason there are a lot of buildings out there where overrides get forgotten. Okay. Um, failed sensors, interesting uh, surprise, um, how many bad sensors are out there. You know, it's easy to detect the one that fails so that the signal goes to minus, you know, some insane number. Sensors can fail in a reasonably acceptable range and cause systems to just not run right and just continue to heat and cool when they shouldn't be. Uh, simultaneous heating and cooling, et cetera. So consistent ROI in under two years is what we see out there. So. So with that, I want to show you how um, we use technology like this, and um, so I'm going to get into a demonstration here. <coughs> so I want to make sure everybody can hear me when I'm sitting down here and not amplified, or maybe yeah, if we can, I want to make sure that everybody can hear me. A lot of times people say I'm plenty loud anyways. Just while, while I have this mic. That data that he was bringing up was for the U.S. side, where they have all the problems with control algorithms. Just, just <laughs> wanted to make that point. Right? I know there'll be much less return on our product up here. <laughs> so, all right. Anyways, um, best way to do this for you is look, we're going to take a little tour for the next 15 minutes. I'm, I'm one of you guys. I'm a facility manager, and I'm going to show you how I'm using this tool and how it's helping me better run my facilities. Okay. So it's all web-based. So sitting in the comfort of my office or my home, I can pull up a browser and I can come into the application and it has you know, kind of the iPhone model. And we're going to start here, called the Site Spark app. This is the core application when we go to look at analytic results. So I click here and the system immediately brings me into a view for today. Most recent data. And you know, I got a five building portfolio. So down the left hand <coughs> column, it tells me about my portfolio. The site called Gatesburg has been detected three sparks and that's our term for an issue, okay? Um, and in fact, three rules were involved. We've got HU fan short cycling has been detected. And if you notice, we can go across and we get the timeline tells us exactly when that happened. So we can see that we've had four issues here. We've also had a situation where the HU is on, but the fan is off. Okay. And then we've got another one that we'll talk about. HU on and fan off. You know, what's that rule mean? It means that the HU has a component on, but there's no proof of run from the fan. Well, I can see an interesting pattern here right away. During the fourth short cycle event on the HU, we also got a proof of flow fault. So this thing's cycling and cycling, and the flow switch is dying because of it, and it didn't trigger. Okay. Now down in headquarters, I've only had one spark today. Let me tell you about that. We're getting ready to go on a new commodity rate. The uh, power company showed up with a great rate, half the price for KWH. Okay. So I was like, wow. But it's got a penalty. Right, so the penalty is at 450 kW, and so what I did is I'm you know working with my controls contract, but I set up a simple little rule to help us both to see how we're tracking against it, right? Because I'm going to go on the right May first, so I got a little bit of time to improve things, and I see from here that good thing I'm not on that right today because at uh, 8 11 a.m. right through the last date I have at uh, you know 10:43, the main meter has been above that limit, so I'd be paying a penalty for today. So we got some more work to do, Rick. Right? strategies okay um, same thing down at short pump so what we're seeing here is a quick assessment of my sites the types of issues I'm having and the duration and when they happen I know exactly when these happen okay. and in the final column exactly which piece of equipment triggered the problem because you know what I'm running these rules on hundreds of pieces of equipment at the moment HU fan short cycling has been detected on RT2 fan so that's a quick look for today. Now, another difference about analytics is it isn't just about what happened in the last minute. You know, alarms are like I had. Analytics is about patterns. Now, it might take a minute for a pattern to form. It might take an hour. It might take a day. It might take a week. It might take a month. It might take an entire season because we might be detecting a pattern that happens in the shoulder season or in the heating season or cooling season. So you got to get our head around the fact that you know analytics is about periods of time. So one of the the tools we give you is it's like an instant search feature. We can go look at any period of time we want. So let's go take a look at last month. Okay, so I'm going to pick month. 
I'm going to pick last month. And now we're going to see our results for February. Okay, so February 2012 across my portfolio, here's an instant summary of the issues I had, right? Carytown site had 40 sparks. They involved three rules, okay? Oh, no, this again? Lights on and unoccupied, oh, $240. My boss isn't going to be happy because, you know, that's considered like, why did you let that happen, Joe, right? 100 hours, and now my cursor tells me date by date when the problem happened and the relative duration. So I can see exactly when these problems happen, okay, on the main light status. But, you know, this has got my attention, right? $240 in one of my sites, I gotta stop what I'm doing. I gotta know how big is this problem across my entire portfolio, right? So I can quickly say, hey, right now I need to filter. I just wanna know about that one issue. Forget everything else for the moment. Let's see what type of problems I'm having with that. And oh, sure enough, it's more than one site. Carytown, $240. Short Pump, $238 just in February. Holy smokes. You know, I gotta do something about this. Now it's gonna cost something, right? Someone say, I gotta roll a truck, but. I've got the data to tell me the value. Just in February, it was almost $500. Okay. Now, one of the things we can do is we can send an email about the spark, okay, into the ant system so you can get additional information about these, you know, not only alarms, but now issues that have been detected, right? Because this isn't like an alarm, there's no heat that I have to rush out the door. It's like, Hey, we get to better get this planned in here in the next few days to take care of this problem, right? Okay. But I also have another thing, you know, I got to get a PO approved. And when I go to my boss, first thing he's going to say is, you know, well, I should take it out of your pay because it's not supposed to. Be. But the point is, I need to share this information to help people understand. And our software allows us to do that. We can instantly export anything on the screen in an HTML format. And now I can email that to my boss and say, hey, look, we detected this. It's going to cost me about half of this to get the problem fixed. We're going to have a two-week payback. So please approve this PO, the types that people don't want to approve. But we can see why we should approve it, right? It's worth 300 bucks to get this taken care of. Right. Okay. So this is managing by data. We have actual data that tells us what's really going on with these problems. All right, so let's go back to all of our rules so we get an example, uh, go into some of the other capabilities. So I'm looking across my portfolio and I'm scrolling down to Gaithersburg and I see, you know, I got 148 issues there. We got a lot of issues. I, it's involved, what, eight of my different rules. And uh, this one grabbed my attention. Outside ear damper stuck open. Okay. Let's look at the help. Yeah, outside ear damper stuck open. And what it says is the damper should be closed, but we're, the system is looking at the temperature differential between mixed air and return air and saying, hey, you can't achieve that if you don't have outside air coming in. We're running an algorithm against data that's sitting there. Okay? It didn't produce an alarm. It's a pattern in the data. So we're drawing in outside air. We may think that data is closed. The command signal may be out of the BAS to close it. Okay? But it's open. We're drawing in outside air. So this is troubling because I can see that it, it seems to be happening you know, for short periods of time all through the month. It happened on Thursday, the 2nd of February. Tuesday the 14th, happened again on the 21st, the 22nd, the 24th. You know, I, I need to know more about this, okay? So I can pick any one of these and click on it, and now we're going to drill down. So we're going from our portfolio view, we're going to drill down. And we can drill down to that site for that day, or you know what, we could drill up to all of our sites for that day. Because if I've got a portfolio of buildings, my first thing might be, wow, is this happening everywhere? Or is this just here? Well, I'll go to this site. Now we're looking at that one site, Gaithersburg, for that one specific day, and now it's organized all of my issues, my sparks, by the piece of equipment they're associated with, right? And sure enough, here's outside ear damper stuck open, and now I can drag my cursor along and I get a detailed timeline. It shows me that problem occurred at 5.40 p.m. And it lasted until 6.26, and then it went away and came back at 6.41 and lasted until 7.25. But I see something else here obvious. This problem happened coincident with this other problem of a heat and cool mode short cycle. So it's like the unit's gone through some kind of convulsion and the damper's getting stuck open. That's what it looks like at a high level. You know what, I need to know more. So I'm gonna click here, I'm gonna drill down to the next step. And now I come down to a detailed, what we call fault detection display, okay? And here are my problems on a timeline. 
But now what the system has done, it's automatically correlated with the weather conditions. We have a built-in subscription to a worldwide weather service. That even includes Canada. <laughs> <laughs> right. So you always have weather data. You may have outside air temperature and humidity on your BS, that's common. We give even, you know, much more data than that. So it's correlated it, and then it went and grabbed all of the I.O. data from the points. So I can see, all right, discharge pressure, been humming along steady, you know, up to the problems. I can see my temperature trends, I can see my set point, and I can see the control signal to the damper. Steady, all day. So the control loop is not modulating crazily to cause this problem, it's some other type of problem. And the next thing I can see is how the whole day played out on a timeline. So I can see what happened. Well, hey, this is interesting. Early in the morning, 6.28 p.m., the fan came on and two stages of heat. And I could have sworn that we expected one stage of heat on an initial call. So I've seen something else there that's probably wasting money, all right? And then that second stage went off and then it came back on again when we went occupied. We ran two stages of heat right through until 4.14. It backed down to one stage of heat until 5.42. And what happened at 5.42? That's when the problem occurred. My temperature started to go down, and sure enough, right here on the, on the screen, I can see it. Cooling, stage one, came on at 6.27 through 6.42. 15 minutes of cooling in the middle of a heating day? What's that about? Followed by the damper stuck open, followed by this exact same behavior, two stages of heat starting simultaneously on a call. Now what's important about this is all of this is automatically assembled. Not only do the analytic rules find the patterns, the analytic rules assemble and build all of the screens on the fly to show you the issues that have been found. And we can click anywhere and get a pop-up summary showing us all of the data from the temperature conditions to the status of the rules to the, all of the I.O. data, so I can ex exactly see what is happening and get a different perspective, okay? There's a great, you know, having a graphic of an air handler with the fans and the damper, and that's great, but that's a snapshot in time. What we're seeing here is how the whole system plays out, and we've been brought to this, this has been brought to our attention because issues have been detected in the operation of the facility, okay? This is what we mean by automated operational analytics applying analytic techniques to find these types of patterns in the data, okay? And as quickly as I came down here, I can drill back up to my site or back up to all of my sites or pick any period of time. Going back as far as I have data for. That's another advantage to adding, you can add these technologies to existing systems and if you have historical data that's been stored, the analytics don't just start today and go forward. They'll go back through all the data. So if you get data for last year, I can I can show you, you know, what was happening in 2011 in November. Let's take a look, okay? And now the system will show us, it'll go back in time and show us what types of issues we had based on the analytic rules that we're running back in November, okay? But I started the software this week. If you got the data, it apply the rules to your past history and we can see the types of issues we've had, okay? across the whole, any period of time. So that's a, a quick look at what, and hopefully a good way to show, you know, what we mean by operational analytics, but now I wanna, you know, let's open it up and go yet another step, because what we're showing here are issues detected that many of them relate to energy waste, many of them relate to operational problems, maintenance, maybe this is gonna help me prioritize where I spend my money, how I spend my money, in fact, that's what we've seen is this becomes the driving force in planning maintenance budgets and maintenance activity. Because you know what to look at and you go, yeah, you know, I, I, I know that's a problem, but I'm not going to get to that one right away. That's okay. It isn't going to go away. The system's going to keep showing you that you're having this problem. But there's a whole other aspect to this around, purely around energy and energy-related analytics. So what we're going to do now is we're going to hop over to another tool, which is called the energy application. And we're going to start looking at all of this stuff from the perspective of energy. Okay. All right, we've got uh, three tools here that we'll go through uh, quickly. And the first one of the tools is uh, called the usage tool. You know, I think this is probably pretty you know, common. We'll explore a little deeper and hopefully show you some interesting things. So I'm looking at yesterday, so I have a full day of data. Here are my five sites. 
in my chart I've got a, you know a pen on the graph for each one of those sites I can come in and click anywhere and it highlights the data and shows me the exact values at any point in time that I select so I can see you know what's happening I can see where that little peak was so we can talk about plan it's interesting my peak appears to be you know right around 10 10 in the morning you're you're only interested in afternoon so yeah. not going to make any money shedding that peak it might save some energy but you know okay the other thing I can do is I can I can uh, zoom in you know if I want to zoom in I can actually get the actual data entries these are the the history samples coming out of the control system right okay so back out you know now one of the things I might do with this is uh, you know let's compare our facilities okay let's rank them and see how they stack up against each other by the way I can look at KW KWH dollars gas water I can convert it to BTUs whatever your uh, desired uh, units are okay hey now when we look at it on the basis of KW peak over yesterday ranked high below we find out you know headquarters is the highest consumer KW uh, it's not much of an insight it's the biggest building so let's get a little more intelligent here and let's bring in some of the other data that's available like square footage one of the key things about the types of data you use for analytics is it just isn't the temperatures and damper positions it can be the address the square footage of course we get the weather it could be the occupied square feet it could be the number of hospital beds full uh, you know production measures if you will because we want to combine that together I'll give you a quick example where that could be useful we had a customer they had five years of monthly energy data so they didn't even have BAS they were just getting started monthly energy data and they had four years of, this was real interesting, quarterly tenant satisfaction data. And the question was, are my tenants happy or more efficient or inefficient? Because, you know, the bean counter said, I'm not giving me any capital budget. Everybody's happy. I'm releasing space, right? Well, what if tenants are actually happier where the buildings are inefficient? I'm probably going to have to go look for another job. Energy's actually, they found out tenants were happier in efficient buildings because they run better but they found something they never expected. They found that their building stock built in the 70s and 80s was actually more efficient than the ones built in the 90s and early 2000s, and they were stunned. Combining energy and just enterprise data, right? So it isn't just about temperatures and energy. All right, so anyways, we're gonna take that area, and now we're gonna look at KW per square foot. And we see, based on that, headquarters is the most efficient, you know, Carytown has emerged as wow, it's virtually almost twice the next site. So I, f I found an energy hog. Well, what if it's in a different climate area, right? Maybe it's not all in the same city. Let's make sure we use our weather data. Now we're going to apply degree days to it. Now we're going to look at KW per square foot per degree day. You guys know what square feet are up here? <laughs> we do metric too. I just don't. I miss that. So. Um, KW per square foot per degree day confirms that Carytown is substantially higher than the others. But let's think again before we jump to a conclusion. This happens to be headquarters plus four restaurants. What if that's my busiest restaurants? Most people lined out the door, most meals, door open, you know. That's valuable data. Probably doesn't come out of the BAS system. What if that customer could provide me information on the revenue per site? Now I'm going to find out, is it because it's busy? And now I'm looking at the KW per dollar per square foot per degree day, and it confirms that, hey, we've normalized for everything, Rick. You are running the most inefficient restaurant in our chain. Okay. So you got any other ideas of why this is happening? I'm not in the same business. <laughs> so, so anyways, the point here is there's lots of factors. It isn't just what the KW is higher, it's what the energy intensity per intended use is, okay? And the app allows us to do that. Other thing we can quickly do is let's take a quick look at baseline and benchmarking. Maybe I want to compare this against last year quickly, okay? So I can see how I'm improving because it's high, but I'm doing better. See? Yesterday is better than the baseline of last year. So we're doing better on all of these sites. You know, one day might have been a mild day. That really doesn't tell us much you know so maybe we'll look at last month against the previous year so now when we look at last month there's the previous year it confirms we are doing better this year that's great against last year but you know what that's not the goal for the organization the goal passed down was to reduce energy by intensity by 10 percent 
we can set up custom baselines or benchmarks. So how about let's comparing you against last year, less 10%, which is what we're really being measured on this year. And when we do that, we see that we have a way to go. We're not achieving our goal. We're better than last year, but we're not achieving our goal. So you can set up all of these custom for you, application, customer specific benchmarks and baselines to track all of this type of data. Okay. So that's one quick example. Let me show you another couple of ones here. I think we're doing okay on time. Um, I take this stuff off and show you another tool that uh, is really now is going to combine energy and operation. Okay. I'm going to go back to uh, yesterday. And I'm going to go to another energy tool we call the operations tool. And what we do with the operations tool is now we're going to use the power of the system to combine energy and operational data to provide additional insights. Okay. So here we're going to pick an individual site, the Gaithersburg site. The first thing it does is it automatically scans the database and finds all the meters in there that are associated with the site. Okay. And I'm going to pick a meter. I'm going to pick the main meter. And can anybody guess what I'm going to get when I click on the main meter? I'm going to get a chart, right? Well, yeah, but we're going to get something very different. At the top is the chart showing my energy consumption profile for yesterday. Underneath it is the insight. What we've done is we've aligned the operation of all the equipment. So no longer do we just see a chart and go, well, you know, my energy comes up at 9 in the morning. Now we know why. Down here it shows us exactly which pieces of equipment are affecting this. Okay? So we know how the operation of our equipment is affecting our energy performance curve. So we can see the impact instantly. We can even go and add that weather data I talked about. Let's add the weather because I want to see how the weather trend affects this. And now we get a weather trend line also aligned with our energy and the operation of our equipment. And we can come in here and click anywhere and get the exact values at any point in time that's of interest to us. Okay. So let me do something here. So I'm looking at this. You know, now I'm doing analysis as a as a person, right? I'm I'm applying my brain to this. The last step it was telling me, hey, I found this for you. you know, I'm looking at this and I go, well, you know, I'm looking at this building right about 9 a.m. is when we come up near peak. Right about 9.15 we drop off. Hey, my conclusion is this building is running according to occupancy. It's not running 24 7 Pretty good. Well, one of the things we can do is confirm that. Okay. Oops. We can add other data items. So if we happen to have the occupancy data, from the BAS or even from a spreadsheet. We had someone who didn't have it and they had a spreadsheet for occupancy. Okay, whatever. Load it in and now there's the occupancy indicator and we can confirm it. Right, so it's better than just guessing. Right, pretty cool. Well, I got a thousand sites. Rick, you'll let me know when you're done checking all 999 big, big, other ones. Yeah, a lot of keys on my belt. Okay, but that's the point. What I got here was a thought, an insight. You know, I care that my buildings run according to occupancy. This gave me the insight. Now what I would do is write a rule. Tell me just the sites that aren't running according to occupancy, where the energy doesn't drop off X percent, or even it's a slope. You can set the slope of a line for drop off around occupancy. I haven't got time to look at 999 sites. I want to know the 37 of them that aren't conforming. So, this tool is kind of like insight, but you turn that insight into a rule and let the system take care of it for you automatically, and then you just get informed by email, fed up through their automated system. So these are the types of problems, these are the <coughs> costs of the problems, you know, and uh, actually understand what's going on. With you. So, okay. One more tool while we're while we're or two more in while we're talking about the energy app. Let's go take a look at. Oh, by the way, you can drill down to submeters. Okay, you'll get just that meter and the system will automatically deduce what loads should be plotted against it. Okay. The other thing we can do is we can take physical meters, like the main meter is physical, of course. The HVAC is a physical submeter. The lighting's a physical submeter. But what we did was we took main and subtracted the other two out and said, you know, the rest is just plug load. It's, not, you know, it's, it's insignificant, right? It's miscellaneous. It's insignificant, huh? 
Well, something insignificant is taking us from 62 kW up to 147 kW within one 15-minute interval. You didn't see that when you were looking at the aggregated. This is actually a calculation, but you can tell a calculation it's a virtual meter. And from then on, the system analyzes it like a meter. And I show this because it's cool. It's actually from a real application that we did. And from North, North Country, it was cold. The customer was stunned. What the heck? You know, that, that's a lot of space heaters under desks, right? That's not what it was. Turned out they had electric humidifiers on their hand list that people had just forgotten about. They'd been in so long. They weren't tied into the BAS, they weren't managed, they had a little internal control, and they would just fire off whenever they wanted to. They were able to use this data, and, and, and this was in Wisconsin, they were able to use it and actually go to the power company to get a check from the power company. You guys are great with checks. Um, to convert to gas-fired humidification because of this, because the power company didn't want the spikes either. No one would have ever seen this without the insight that came from it. We just kept running away with it. Okay, and it had a, not only a peaking, but an energy saving so long, energy saving. So just an example of how it gets used. Uh, let's talk about one more thing. We've talked about demand. I want to talk a little bit about profiling analysis here. And uh, we're going to look at uh, one of the most common tools. If you, you want to get involved in demand response, I think one of the first things, you can confirm if I'm wrong, and we're going to want to know the demand profile of the facility, right? So we can take a look at it. We've got a tool to do that, all right? So you pick the period of time, and uh, maybe we think our worst month is February. And so now the system has calculated the KW demand profile for my site, Gaithersburg, based on February data. So I can see what the profile looks like. Interesting, I, this, this facility doesn't peak in the mid-afternoon, at least not in the winter. All right? Again, restaurant peaks around the dinner hour. Okay? So I can see that profile. And I could do a bunch of things here. I could, you know, I could look at KW or KWH or other measures. I could normalize it. I could add weather. Maybe I want to look at that. You guys, you guys are looking at just raw KW typically, right? Yeah, okay, so we don't need to do that. I could baseline it. Oh, but this is important. You know what? This facility is not open on Sunday, so I do not want to pollute my average because I can get an incorrect profile and, you know, fail, you know, to get my demand response check. So now it's calculated by dropping out all of the Sundays, okay? So I get KW, daily average of KW, Monday through Saturday, just like that, okay? So what else might I, might I want to do here? So I've got some other tools. Of course, I can come in and look at the data, etc. Let me show you another tool that's interesting. Once I look at this, I might want to look at another report called the Daily Overlay. And this tool will show us all of the weekdays in February overlaid around that average. So the dark blue line's the average, but what I can see with this is the variability of my demand. Right? I can see outliers and how variable that performance is. Okay? Now you know where this gets potentially really useful is we're looking at raw KW right now. What's one of the major factors that will influence variability of my demand? Weather. Right? So let's use the weather data. Let's go and normalize it for degree days. So what would we expect once we normalize these curves with weather? What do we think? They're going to be nice and smooth. It's going to be much more consistent operation. Okay? All right. Well, let's take a look. And sure enough, the graph is totally different. It's much more consistent, but it actually magnifies the results of any of the outliers. What the heck was going on on this day which is February 24th. It wasn't weather. I've got a day that is way out of whack there. Where might I go with that information? Go back to the operations tool, pull up that day, and see what was running on that day because it's way out of whack compared to the other sites. Okay? When you do demand, when you're looking at that, you guys have to deal with the risk from weather, right? This could give additional insight of how this facility performs with weather. Yep. Okay? So that's that, and one more tool related to demand, so we're talking about that today, take off degree days. Um, we have what we call low duration. So you want me to reduce my demand, okay? And I gotta get down to, I gotta shed X amount. X amount for four hours. How many hours? Let's say I need to get down to 450, okay? I can drag my cursor here and click here and I find out that in February I exceeded 450 for 63 hours. I know the magnitude of the changes I will need to make. 
It's 63 hours. Now, in fact, I looked at this when I was going on that commodity rate, the new commodity rate, because, you know, I got to stay below 450, and I need to know, hey, how much work is this going to be? How many changes are we going to need to make to the control sequences? You know, how many peaks are we going to pull down? 63 hours during the worst, you know, month of the year. That's, uh, I talked to Aaron guys. They said, no problem. They can take care of that program in the system, smooth those peaks out, okay? So I get that information, and of course, you know, being the type of person I am, I said, oh, really? Well, maybe I can get on that 300 kW rate, huh? Mm -hmm. Well, 349 hours. Can you guys take all my peaks out for 349 hours? Probably not. You probably can't go that far. But this allows you to gauge exactly how much of your operation is over any demand limit and have a real picture. And in fact, I can show you another report that will tell us exactly when that is. Let me show you that real quick. This report will tell me exactly when I'm above 450. Different type of report, it's called a histogram, and now we can see when the time's in the black box and for how long, the width of the red, how long do I exceed that? So I can see the magnitude of time that my peaks are. So when I looked at this site, headquarters, I know I've got you know virtually whole days where I'm above 450. I'm going to have to do a bunch of work there. But you can see why th these two sites I thought were a candidate for these new rates. These are short periods of time. This is just a little intelligent control. I'm going to smooth these demand peaks out. Okay. And again, every one of these reports can be saved and shared. So if I want to look at this and compare it with a benchmark or a baseline right, of the previous year, I can do that see how it tracks, about the same. I can share this, shoot it right over to you to, to take a look at the, you know, this is what I got, what do you think? Oh, yeah, you look like a good candidate. It's an HTML page, it even includes all the data in case you want to check the data that I use for this. Okay. So that's the energy suite. Now we, we have more tools, but I, you know, that's the points we wanted to make is, we're entering a new age here where we've got software tools that can take the data you've most all, probably already invested in and drive additional value in energy, demand, and operational savings, and of course, uh, help you quantify what that, what that means to you. So, I'll be glad to take, uh, take any questions uh, you know, on this and how it works or anything. <coughs> yeah? Is there a need to redefine the issues the program can identify? Is there what? A need to redefine the issues. Yes, there is. Uh, the system comes with an extensive library that we built working with customers for the last couple of years of common issues. In fact, it has two libraries. It has lots of common rules because virtually everybody should be tracking against Occupy hours, broken sensors, and other things like that. But in addition, for the people who program and set it up, we have an extensive library of what's called analytic functions that look for a pattern of a type. Like a pattern might be find all periods of time when cooling is on and economizer is open. We have that built in there. Now you might say, oh, yeah, great. If that ever happens, that's a spark, an issue. But these guys might say, no, 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 that's really the first step in a more sophisticated analysis. I'm going to find that and combine it with something else. So we have extensive libraries as well over 150 of those functions in there that the Aaron team assembles appropriate for your building type, equipment type, usage type. Okay. Do you have the um, uh, hardware requirement for each issue? Because if you don't provide the input, you cannot get you know, we, we're the software company. That's where you depend on these guys, right? Okay? They've seen hundreds, thousands of these things. We identify economizers not working right, and it's on train <laughs> units. You go, yeah, we've seen that. Train had a problem. They're economizing the controller. We've been seeing that for years. You're going to have to do this. But we, you know, we find the issues. But that same problem in your building could be a totally different cause than in this building, right? And even when it happens, I'll give you a good example. I was asked a, a question along those lines when we found the damper stuck open. They said, well, that's really cool. Why don't you fix it, John? The damper stuck open. Well, maybe I need to deliver a hard hammer hit to the linkage. <laughs> or maybe the linkage has come off. Not everything is automatically fixable by somebody sitting in front of a screen. And that's where you need the, you know, the service skills and equipment knowledge. And in fact, what, what we see happen in most engagements is it becomes a very consultative relationship between uh, 
uh, you know, our partner who's delivering this to you and your maintenance and operations staff. You say, I find 500 things. You don't care about it. You can't fix them all. What do you want to do? You want to find the 50 most, schedule them in, get the money, get the return, then go after the next one. So it really emerges like a very consultative relationship, but now it's one based on facts that you can see, that you can bring to your management, that they can see. So, yeah. System looks quite sophisticated. Must be a lot of training involved, though. Uh, understand it all. Well, there there certainly is stuff to learn. Okay. Um, actually, everything I've shown you, I hope I hope you'll have the impression is you could sit here and click the mouse. But to set it up, there's work to be done, right? You got to connect to the data. Well, with most of the systems these guys these guys deploy, there's a very standard way to do that. Okay. Um, but if you had some, you know, older proprietary system, work might be involved just to connect to the data. So connecting the data is one place that there is effort that could be this much or this much. The second is understanding that data. Were the points named with a consistent and common sense naming convention, or is it like a game of Scrabble trying to figure out what, what the heck did all those names mean? That could take time to set it up. And then the final thing is setting up the rules. You know, the RN team is you know trained and experienced in that. Um, we find that. I mean, you know, of the people who are end users here, how many program their own building automation systems? It's kind of the same thing. I think you're going to rely on them and their uh, engineers and technicians to set it up appropriate for you. But the goal of operation is you should, you know, hopefully feel comfortable clicking on your browser, bringing it up, clicking on the, you know, there's probably, you know, 10 different option drop downs that get you through everything in the product. But there is work to set it up. There's no question about it uh, to do that. John, just to speak a little bit more to it, I, I think that, uh, uh, and it speaks to the automation systems that we installed today versus the ones that, that we were putting in 10 years ago, is the, the, the graphical presentation, the, the way the system is delivered to you as you see it, becomes very simplified, uh, becomes very point and click. You know, the, yes, there's absolutely going to be some training as to how, how you set all your filters and find, you know, how you access the data you're specifically looking for. But the end user experience should be a, a relatively easy training process. How we get there, okay, is, is how we in, uh, interact with, with uh, our partner and how we interact with the end user as far as what they want that presentation to look like. And then we assemble all that and we deliver it. Um, just from automation systems alone, um, when we used to work with older proprietary uh, systems seven, eight, ten years ago, uh, it was this is how it works and this is how you have to learn to use it. So for us to take that, and, and a lot of the information came in, in programming nomenclature, so now you have to learn to some degree the code in which the systems were built on. So the training was onerous and sometimes really we never could ever fully develop, de uh, deliver the training that was required. And so, so, you know, when I think of our training programs 10 years ago, they were, an, they were an all day event and they probably should have been a whole week event and then some. Today, we can deliver a graphical user interface that looks so much like a web page, you know, that almost everybody in this room, you know, uses Google and, and, and surfs through the internet for information that they want. And we, we, we present uh, RBAS systems in that in a very similar format, and our training is usually now down to four hours plus. And we leave the client, given the client is interested and wants to learn, uh, with good working knowledge of the system inside of a day. And, and, and I'm not saying that, that we could do the same with, with, with the analytic side of things, because again, all the different filtering mechanisms and the complexity of the delivery would really have a lot to do with what the client's needs are. But I, I don't think that, that you need to be concerned about the complexity and, and, and the userability of the system. I, I think that uh, once it's delivered to you guys in, in a user format, uh, I think you'd be very impressed with it. Any other questions? I, I would just want to follow up on that. and, and I said it earlier, but now maybe it, it, it's, you know, it'll be uh, a little more relevant. You know, we're showing some deep insight into equipment systems going all the way down, assuming we have BAS data. But again, I said, you know, it's easy to get started without all of that data. Let me give an example from one of our uh, um, uh, very successful case study in the U.S., uh, a company called Duke Realty. 
they run Class A office buildings in suburban city areas. Had a 130 building portfolio. Went through a presentation like this. Guy said, wow, that, that looks really cool. I want to give it a try. And he said to me, he said, I'll give you two pieces of data. I was like, okay, that's it? That's all I can mention? Yeah. He said, I'll give you two pieces of data to start. We will give you interval meter data once a night at midnight. He said, I got that. It's on an FTP server. I give you a link and a password. Your magic software goes and gets it. And I said, what's the other? He says, I got a spreadsheet with the expected occupancy times based on the leases. That was the start of the project. Up and running in 10 days. Payback in under 90 days, OK? Because what did he find? Over a third of his buildings were running 24. 24-7. Over time, they've been overridden, and a tenant complained, and, there's a, and their local manager who manages 25 buildings just turned the thing on, right? Because the thing you don't want is, you know, tenants having major problems and coming back on the lease. So this had evolved to just this disarray, even though these are, these are really nice office buildings. He used the tool as an educational tool, gave them all. Remember, this is all web-based. It's just a browser. Gave his guys and said, okay, Let's take a look at your building, Rick. Here's what we found, and this is what we need to do. So let's go back. Why are we doing this? He used it as an educational turn tool and turned that, his whole facility around. Then he took the, the money he was able to prove that he saved, and he started going deeper, and now it's connected to the BAS systems. And he wrote us an interesting email about an example he had. He called up one of his uh, operators and said, hey, main air handler out there in Gaithersburg, you got a broken temperature sensor on the supply. We got it. No. Nah. Guy pulled up his 3D view of his air handler. Everything looks fine. So the you know the, the corporate guy said, um, shut the air handler off. Temperature change? No. And the guy says, How did you know? Because this was an example of it failed at a reasonable value. Okay? And the reason is is a pattern you can detect in broken sensors. Okay? The guy getting all excited because now he saw a tool that's going to help him, right? Instead of getting an emergency call, you know, it was okay on that day, but now get a hotter day where that sensor's not working and, you know, he's got 50 calls and unhappy tenants and all of that. So you can start easy, that, and that's a key difference than, you know, installing equipment where you got to you know, get a wire and install it and make it run. You can really start easy, and you know, these guys can work with you to, to put together a plan that, you know, would have a quick return from. Yeah, we've actually got a situation like that right now with the Toronto Housing Authority where they've got over 2,000 buildings in the, in the city of Toronto and uh, they're looking to get started on this and it's like, well, how much is this going to cost me? Well, how much do you want to do? Right? And, and we says, uh, you know, 2,000 buildings is, is going to be a, a major project for you and it's going to be, quite frankly, a major project for Aeron uh, as well. So why don't we work together, get our feet wet on this? We picked the building, and uh, we had a budget. And what we did is, is we, we, we assembled a, a, a scalable solution for them that met their budget, is going to give us the opportunity to implement, test the software, give them an opportunity to, to see the value of, of that software. And uh, we're in the initial stages of moving that forward right now. So you know, I know when you see something like this, I know what my you know, you know what happens in my mind is two things: is well, you know, who's got a million dollars to buy this stuff, right? And who's got a million guys that can program this stuff, right? You know, and uh, the key that the fact is, you don't need a million dollars to buy it, and you don't need a million programmers to initiate it, right? You need one problem and one solution, and then you work from there. And the beautiful thing about it is. Is you're not buying this in in you know in cardboard boxes, okay? Where where you spend thirty thousand, fifty thousand, a hundred thousand, you have you have an initiation cost, you have a maintenance fee, and then basically what you have is 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 you know a budget by budget kind of a building kind of block uh, uh, kind of a, a approach to it. You return on every step. Yeah. That's interesting generalities. How do you price it a little more specifically? 
Well, well, the way we'd look at the TCHC job, because we just recently went through that, is again, they had 2,000 buildings, over 2,000 buildings. Uh, uh, we've got automation systems uh, fully implemented in about 25 of their buildings. Um, and it was like, well, we need to keep this thing under a $10,000 budget, uh, on the lower end of a $10,000 budget. So, so we, we looked at the portfolio. We, we Initially, we wanted to stick with buildings that we had a history on because you do not need, you can apply this to any automation system because almost any automation system that's not in legacy right now can, be, can create a point .csv file, uh, an Excel spreadsheet. And if you can convert to an Excel spreadsheet, you can implement SkySpark. You can probably do it on less than that, okay? Mm -hmm. But anyways, we wanted to stick with the, with the facilities that we uh, ha had a, a, a better intimate knowledge with. And so we picked one, uh, it was actually a High Park uh, apartment just outside of High Park, Toronto, and, and we looked at the mechanical room and it was complex enough that we felt that it would give us some true measurements of, of, of efficiencies, because if it was, too, it was too simple, then what are we gonna show, right? And so we basically took a, you know, a, a, a typical estimating approach to it is, is we created points, we came up, I think, with about 50 or 60 points that we would want, BAS points that we would want to measure. We laid those, we, we knew where they were in the building because we recently upgraded the building, and so we, we assigned a value to each one of those points, assembled the job, put the cost of the material in on it, and put our appropriate markup on it, and uh, passed it on to, to, to the purchasing manager at, at the Toronto Housing Authority. And I think we're, uh, we came in under budget, I think we were about $8,200 uh, for, for that project. So uh, every project really is going to, it requires, um, I mean if it's negotiated work, would require some form of, of, of discussion with the owner to establish the scope of work. Uh, and, I, and I think a kind of phased approach is, is really a, a good way of looking at it because it, it can be affordable, it can give everybody that's going to be using it the ability to gain some comfort with it, to, to, to see the results of it, and then based on the ROIs that, that, that are relatively short term, because you can select short term ROIs, you can start to apply that and, and, and expand it through your, through your facility. You know, I, I think from a, uh, I know we've got a, a, a diverse group here, but when I, when I think of uh, um, you know, some of the, the city facility management managers, I think of the region, uh, energy performance contractors. Uh, I think that this would be a, a, a great tool for, for, you know, for anyone that has a big for portfolio to manage. Uh, you know, you, you can only have so many people in trucks and with, with keys running around and checking things, right? And it's costly and it's not really that effective, right? Um, to be able to collect that data and, and you know, select, you know, you know, prioritized flags that are gonna that are gonna pick off the big problems first, and then give you the ability to schedule that through your organization as to uh, on a on a on a priority basis of, of what the problem is and how much it's costing you is just an amazing tool, and it really is what automation should be doing for you, especially in this day and age. So that example that you just gave yeah. the Toronto housing, yeah. That building already had the points and the building automation system in it? Yes, it did. Okay. Yeah. Okay. In my example, he didn't allow us any touch of the building automation system. I'll give you the manual meter data that he gets from the power sure. company put on, and I'll give you a schedule. And he wanted to prove that he returned before he connected. Now, with the air handlers, he's been monitoring all his major air handlers, which is the next swap he decided to take. He is connected live, but he knew the value that he was going to get out of it easy to see it. Again, this gets back to, it's not like, you can't buy half a chili, you can't put in half a control system, you can put in 10% of that. You know, and I think just to, to expand on that a little bit, like <coughs> some, some of the people in this room would have multiple multiple control systems. Uh, I know we've got a group from De, uh, DeFasco uh, that, that have a whole industrial side uh, uh, of, their, of their facility. Then they have the buildings and warehouses that house all that equipment, and then they have their obviously their offices. And what you guys would be able to do, because of the fact that this is adaptive and, and it's analytical, you could pull data from all of your existing invested systems. You wouldn't have to turn around and sweep one system in 
in order to have uh, you know have use of uh, you know the Sky Park, Sky Spark technology. Yeah, connect to CSV files, Excel files, SQL databases, uh, Honeywell Niagara based products. I mean, there's all kinds of ways to get the data in. But the scoping is what data is available mm -hmm. and how do you get it, and then what's the first? Yeah, what's the top ten rules we want to start with that mm -hmm. we think will that in a discussion we think will deliver value. And you can program in any rules you want. Any rules, fully programmable. Again, an extensive library of tools makes it you know faster and easier to get after those things. Right? Because you have all of those. Um, so, okay. Rick, are you guys programming the system for your customers, or no, there, there are implementation parts. We're a software company. Yes. Uh, make an analogy. You know, if you want to buy an ERP system, you might buy it from Oracle, but somebody's going to set it up and implement. Somebody's got to do it. Aaron's one of our authorized, uh, certified okay. implementation partners. We're purely a software company. We focus on making the software better. They focus on the delivery and gives all the domain knowledge around the systems. That's in the area. You know, it's critical. Area of expertise. Okay. Thanks. Are there any other questions? Yeah. What is the Hyde Park project undertaking? When did you start that? Well, we we've done a budget work on it. Um, we we've had several discussions. We haven't got a purchase order to start on it, but we 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 basically have uh, you know so we haven't started on it at this stage of the game, but we narrowed it down to the scope, and we're expecting approval at any time. Uh, and just. You know, this can go, I know we're mostly engaged here in, in, a, in a facility management buildings kind of a, a group here, but it can go outside of just our core industry. Uh, we're actually got meetings set up with the director of the Lake Louise Ski Resort to look at how we can help them uh, on the snowmaking side. And we're going to be proposing the same type of analytical uh, um, approach to utilizing weather data, uh, snow conditions, um, you know, uh, pumping capacities, potentially moving from from slope to slope to slope, uh, and, and this is all this is all really being done right now through observ manual observation. And these are this is big equipment. I mean, these are big pumps that are that are you know blowing water up the hill and freezing it. So any other questions? How about, is there any questions on the demand response? So uh, I mean, we can we can bring both gentlemen up to the front of the room and uh, we can uh, certainly uh, uh, engage any questions that you might have. I think that uh, uh, one other element, I know we've got consultants in the room and, and commissioners. I think that uh, we'll be using this internally uh, as a commissioning tool uh, I know I, I joked a little bit earlier about the fact that uh, the control systems, you know, being 77% of, of, of the problems that were found, I would agree with that. Um, because when we're trying to set up a control algorithm and we are there on one day and the task of that BAS engineer is in that one day, in that little time that he has on, on site to tune the loop of an algorithm, it's, it's beyond challenge. Okay. At some point, we're we're making some uh, presumptions, uh, and so and when you when when you add all these things together, certainly there are efficiencies that can be found throughout the building and the system over a course of time. Uh, any of the customers out there that I've spoken to face to face, I, I consider this the characterization period, and, and from Aaron's perspective. Uh, we would never be so bold to tell a customer that we can commission that system in four hours and it's done and we're never going to come back. That's not, that's not realistic. What's, what's realistic is it usually takes two or three visits over the course of three seasons to really fine tune a system and it requires motivation on the part of the owner, the consultant and our office and our people to completely fine tune a system to the point where it's working to its optimized uh, uh, capabilities. From an owner's perspective, this is a relatively small investment for my organization to be able to shorten that period down and be able to deliver the answers before the questions are asked. And it's a great tool for consultants' offices to, to apply accountability to the designs that they're implementing 
this can cut back commissioners time on site with gauges right uh, they can run they can run profiles for for six or seven weeks issue reports to, to, to their clients right? <coughs> from from a big facility uh, from an operations perspective you know we've kind of already gone through all the advantages that 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 would uh, that would provide and from an HVAC service contractors perspective we can partner with the clients and the people out there to try and get these problems solved and, and get them off your kind of uh, your cost hit list so uh, with that if there's no further questions uh, I think we're going to have a draw right <laughs> do you have something else? Yeah, one thing I want to say, you mentioned commissioning. Yeah. Um, one of the things we're seeing uh, as far as the use, we're working with a number of energy consultants as well, is you do a commissioning project, you're, f you're doing the hard work to find the potential problems. Okay, now we fixed them. Uh, another study that I didn't show, Lawrence Berkeley Lab proved in a multi-building, multi multi-building, multi-customer study that after commissioning, within 18 months, the building decays back to where it was. It's just a reality, right? Okay. Because you're investing in the commissioning, you're doing a lot of the work to understand the points, understand the systems, understand the potential problems. You turn that into automated ongoing commissioning or continuous commissioning after that commissioning project. Because you've spent a big part of the effort to get SkySpark set up to go and do it automatically from that point out. You've identified the issues. So.